Welcome to Cardboard Conjecture. We're a podcast about board games where we have opinions and conclusions formed on the basis of incomplete information. This episode of Cardboard Conjecture is brought to you by these great Saskatoon businesses. Amazing Stories Comics on 8th Street, Dragon's Den Games on 8th Street, and Breakout Escape Rooms on Faithful Avenue. Welcome to Cardboard Conjecture. I'm your host, Norm. I'm Ryan. I'm Ian. And on this episode, we will be talking about our thinking, doing, playing board games. And the topic this time, Ian, bring us into what this topic is, please. We're going to be discussing all the ways that we can have victory conditions. Cardboard Conjecture is proudly sponsored by Amazing Stories Comics on 8th Street in Saskatoon. They are the winner of the Joe Schuster Award for Best Comic Book Store in Canada, and they were also nominated in 2016 for the U.S. Eisner Spirit of Comics Retailer Award, presented at Comic-Con. Amazing Stories' amazing collection of comic books, board games, puzzles, and collectibles can be found in their store or on their new online website. And welcome back. This is Cardboard Conjecture. Let's get to the segment. What have you been thinking, doing, and playing? And uh, I am going to uh, cut in first here with, uh, I'm going to cut the line, and I'm going to talk about uh, one of my favorite little solo games that I haven't played in such a long time, and I dug it out this weekend. Um, it's the Lost Expedition, uh, and I, could, I say it's an old game. It's 2017. <laughs> Lost <laughs> Expedition, uh, designed by Per Sylvester and uh, published by Osprey Games. Um, this is, the, well, the case. Okay, so first of all, the first thing that, that uh, made my brain pop with this game is the art reminded me of uh, that old Tintin um, uh, uh, Hergé kind of uh, art style. Um, uh, so that's what drew me in. And what it is is basically uh, it's it's a it's a race cooperative race game kind of expedition game where you have a hand of cards, and each card has a um, sequential order because in the first half in the daytime you'll plan your your j- day's expedition through the jungle trying to get trying to cut through the jungle paths to get to uh, um, I think it is uh, the uh, through the Amazon to El Dorado and uh, as all good solo games it's really hard <laughs> um, <laughs> so what you do is uh, in there's a daytime phase and nighttime phase and uh, either solo or as a team you contribute cards uh, in in the daytime and you have to respect the sequential order of these cards um, and then you fire off these cards and each of these cards will have uh, three, I would say kind of three phases of a- activity, instantaneous, conditional, and optional kind of thing. And um, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those uh, uh, sequence programming uh, um, uh, games, I would say. I, not that I would say program movement, but you're basically putting in the cards for, for a, uh, um, left to right uh, program activation and if you plan properly on how you put your cards down you can either skip obstacles or benefit because uh, you, there's there's such a fine line in your resource management of bullets health and food uh, that um, like I said I've perished many a times and uh, so um, if, if you're a person that loves figuring out these puzzles, and sometimes these, these are unsolvable puzzles. Like, I mean, by the time you finish the game, you'll just look at it and go, there was no way, the way these cards came out, there was no way that I could have solved this puzzle more efficiently. So you could, you could take pride in that, I guess, even if you are like me and perish very, I, like it's a, in my experience, the game says it's 30 to 50 minutes, and sometimes my games are five, and then I'm done. <laughs> but uh, You don't find that frustrating, though? No, you no. you find out that you can't, couldn't have won? Like, Well, 
if wouldn't that be a frustrating aspect of it? It's frustrating, but if if after the fact that I determined that every choice I made was the most efficient choice, then I'm good with it. I'm fine. I took the puzzle. I took the puzzle to its its broken completion. I guess right. Um, in in and I, that I think to me that's one of the intrigue, intriguing things of the game is can I pull these cards in the right order can I pl- can I play them at the right time now again I forgot to finish the 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 two phases in the in the daytime you have to respect the cards in their sequential because each card has a number on it in the nighttime you put them in where you want so, mm, that's, so right, that's right yeah so there's it's not just rinse and repeat there's some there's some interesting dynamic um vice versa kind of thing going on so and at each at each end of the the phase of daytime and nighttime you have to have at least one food token or someone's losing health or someone's dying and uh yeah yeah the i i've i've there's there's a lot of my there's a lot of my cadavers on this on this journey to el dorado and i've played this game but uh it's it's a it's a fantastic game and uh and the card art is 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 so awesome like if you like that vintage era uh um art you'll the game is enjoyable just i mean there's some cards where i look at and go oh this card is just devastating all the danger like i mean it it was it's just a bad card but you just look at and go oh look at the alligators chewing something (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah my body after i go through that card so um so yeah that's uh the lost expedition all right um uh ryan okay I'm going to talk about a little game that I finally managed to track down a copy of because there's another real kind of like what grinds my gears type of (laughs) thing. Um, I'm going to talk about a game called The Magnificent, and it's a 2019 release. And the reason why I had so much troubles trying to get acquire a copy of this is that it's not available in Canada. Um, Jeff tried to, like Jeff, our... uh, um, guy buddy that works at uh, amazing stories um gives me some insights into how distribution works sometimes and that this game was not did not reach canadian distribution channels there's some backdoor deals saying that this game could not enter canadian distribution deals it was only ever going to as far as it got into north america it could only ever go to the united states it's because we're better at hockey so um, <laughs> I managed to get a copy off of Miniature Market and had, it was on the, uh, a 50% off sale. So it kind of balanced out. It still ended up costing me like 60 Canadian dollars yep. uh, in, in, in the end of it. But so I, I think it's 25 I American for those people doing <laughs> conversion. <laughs> um, so what made me got this game that, that is so interesting about it is that it is a dice drafting kind of abstract puzzle type of game that has a theme pasted on. And the Magnificent being a, um, you are um, kind of like circus performers and that you're going out and putting on these shows. Um, the theme is very, very similar to say like a Tricarian that I've kind of mentioned oh, yeah. um, in, in the past, but this is a much more abstract puzzle to it. At its heart, it's just a dice drafting game And so what you're going to do is you're going to draft a dice and then you're going to take one of three actions. You're either going to um, gain resources, which in this game is magic gems that allow you to put on your shows, apparently. (laughs) Um, Or you can build out your um, show area with these um, circus tents. And and all the circus tents have these um, polyomino-shaped tiles, because why not? Of course. And, and the third thing you could do is put on a performance and your performance, you need these gems and you also need certain tents in order to house your performances. So really that's all you kind of, kind of do. You kind of, you, you draft from four dice on your turn on your, in a round, and then things get reset and you do this for, um, three rounds. So you only get to get 12 actions in the whole course of the term. So this is another one of those efficiency, um, engines. But what's kind of really cool about this is that when you draft a dice, you're going to have a a row of cards. you got four cards, and these are dice modifiers. 
And so you're going to kind of put your dice on that card and it's going to modify the dice saying, oh, it, whatever you put there is a plus two or whatever dice you put there, you can turn it to whatever color you want. They're different colored dice. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the round, what you're going to do is you're going to draft a new um, dice modifier card. And you also have to give up one of your other cards. That's, that's already, so you have to give up one of your modifying cards. But when you give it up, at the bottom of all of these cards are scoring conditions. <laughs> so now you get to choose how you, you're going to score points for that round. Okay. So it's like, does it depend on the type of tiles you've placed in your camp? Or is it dependent on the pip values of the dice that you drafted that round? Or is it anything and everything? How many different types of gems have you collected that mm -hmm. round? And you'll score these types. You'll score those points. So you've given up a card, scored its points, and now you got to one different card in your row that now you have to take actions with in the next round. You do this for 12 times, add up your points at the very end of the game. And, and you're, you know, it's, it's a very interesting abstract puzzle, especially that fact that I said, I'm going to end up having to give away or give up one of my cards at the end of this round. And yeah. the card that I give up, that's how I'm going to be scoring points this round. I thought that was a really interesting puzzle that you have to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And it's also in the back of your mind when you're drafting a new card um, as well. So, yeah, that's the Magnificent. Uh, we, I've only played one two-player game with Jen, and I've played it probably about a handful. It's got a solo mode, which is kind of like a beat-your-own-score yeah. type of solo mode. And they say that a average good score is getting about above 200 points. So it's a point salad Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't reached 200 points yet. <laughs> it, it looks, I mean, it's visually stunning. Um, it's uh, the it's, graphic design is great. It's now here's the thing though. I mean, what's so difficult about what they're, what they pulled off is that any board with a black background uh, um, or a dark background, uh, if, as far as like, gra uh, uh, you know, visual graphics goes uh, there. It's like, if you make an error, it's a bad error, but, I mean, just looking at some of the images, it's, but they it's balanced stunning. Out with these nice, vi they, yeah, they balanced out that dark background with all these very vibrant, yeah. bright, yeah, colors. There's not that much visual distraction. I mean, it's it's pretty. It, it's uh, I mean, it's, yeah. First of all, it's pretty, um, and it's dark. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, um, magnificent. I saw. No, I'm gonna say. I, I just this past weekend, I saw that board game bliss. Uh, one of the Canadian online retailers um, brought in, got the brought in, got to bring in some copies. I saw they of them pop up on the, and they're all they were they were gone within Doubled like. Up. Um, so there is some hype around this game. It's just uh -huh. too bad that it couldn't enter into Canadian regular Canadian distribution channels. To get yeah, to get eh? they're taking their uh, page from Warner Brothers right now who is making all their 2121 movies available on HBO Max which we don't get in Canada. Mm, yes. How dare they? How well, dare they? Yes, Ian, Canada always gets screwed on HBO. How dare they? Let's go into uh let's go into your contribution. I don't know what kind of segue that was. I was just kind of <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll talk about a little kind of goofy fun word game that we played on bga board game arena a while back and it's a fairly new game i think because i had never heard of it until i was invited uh to try this game out it's called high clue yeah which is like haiku but it's like a word game and it's, it's sort of like a just a different twist on something like code names for example so everyone's there's a set of words out there like five words or somebody something and then everybody gets one of those words and they've got to get everybody else to guess which one is their word but they all you've got is a hand of other words that you have to try to make a haiku out of them to get people to guess your word but the words that you have never work like they're always just terrible words that won't make it work um it's i don't know it was fun i it was a I it's kind of like a throwaway, just I fun thought, little word game. I thought my first impression of this was that it was a, is a is a is a version of Dixit with words instead of images. Yeah, yeah, sort of like that. Yeah, because everybody votes for who yeah. 
what do you th- what they think your word and is point and allocations yeah, for you, uh, get, you get points if people guess your word yeah. you get points if you guessed the word correctly yeah. and the uh, yeah it was very it was yeah, it was very interesting i i like that thing that was like i i didn't realize that everybody had a different set of words in front of them to, oh yeah um to to, to build um, their description so i thought that was kind of neat so that yeah when you say you got garbage words in front of you <laughs> like you're like oh okay so i've got like a word that says like cinderella and i have nothing in but front of me that could describe cinderella or what get i found somebody so to... cool about that game though is is out of all that random nonsense white noise of words that you have in front of you that all of a sudden once you hone in on the correlation of a word to your clue, then all of a sudden, a lot of things started, a lot of that white noise started to go to the background, at least for me. And I, I would be able to see potential connections, right? Uh, right. And uh, as I'm saying this, uh, what everybody can't see is both uh, Ryan and Ian looking at me like, is he going into a beautiful mind mode again? Oh, it's <laughs> tripping out. No, um, but but that's that thing is like is like there's it's just confusion, like you said, it's just nonsense until your brain goes, okay, I have to, you know, to pardon uh, to use a, a psychology term, gestalt. I have to try to f- make form and function out of this nonsensical combinations that I have connected to the the, the clue, and I find from a from a psychology point of view. I find that so intriguing how bad I am at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think it would be, it would be a game that the more you play it, you'd kind of be able to put those word, those phrases together a little bit easier if you played a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you'd have to, your brain would get trained, I think. Yeah. To a sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was fun. We got invited by another, by a group of, of players on BGA. Shout out to Jody, a reluctant listener of the show. Um, and yeah, I thought, I thought yeah. it was, Jody, no, it's fun. Jody it's will listen good. later. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> this episode of Cardboard Conjecture is proudly sponsored by Dragon's Den Games, located in the Louis VIII Mall on H Street in Saskatoon. Swing by Dragon's Den Games and let Darren, Al, and the awesome staff help you out in search for great board games, role-playing games, miniature systems, and all of the related accessories. Be a part of their gaming communities that have scheduled events in their great gaming area. Dragon's Den Games, Louis VIII Mall on H Street in Saskatoon. And we are back. This is Cardboard Conjecture. We're going into our topic of this uh, episode, and it's victory conditions. And I'll hand it off to Ian to give us a more in-depth view of uh, victory conditions. So, Ian, what's the what? Right. So it's kind of a running joke in our show that we we say that the goal of a game is to get the most points, and right? But really, that's not the goal of the game. The goal of the game is what are you doing to get those points? But then I, it caught me thinking about like how many games just use victory points, right? And some people will think that, well, maybe we need to try to switch that up a little bit. And maybe we have, and we just have to explore a little bit. And, and even if we are talking about victory points, what are all the differences and variations within games that do use them? Because they are used quite, or victory points is a pretty big uh, area for our modern board games it's a pretty big way that we covers a lot of and determine who the winner is yeah. right and so i kind of laid out a bit of an outline here and we'll just kind of put together our thoughts and see what we got so the first thing i want to talk about are non-victory point conditions and so let's think about some games that have goal-oriented victory conditions and I think the poster child for this one would be chess, right? If you think about chess, you have a very specific goal for chess. Yeah. You have to capture the king, right? Get the king into checkmate. And the first person who does that wins. So with goal-oriented victory conditions, you're really thinking about uh, trying to make something happen. And 
I think abstracts are really good with this. Right? This yeah. is kind of a something that works really well with yeah. the abstracts. Would um, I'll just throw this out there, and you guys can say yes or no. Would a race be a goal oriented oriented victory condition, like a race game? Yeah, like you're thinking like a Formula D or something like yeah. that. Yeah, eh? yeah, yeah. Like Downforce, because so. because like you said, the the goal is to cross the finish line first. Right. But I see where you're going with the chess thing, where where it's it's mm -hmm. the elimination of a certain iconic piece, or yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, or like like Hive is kind of the same thing, right? Surround the queen, surround yeah. the other person's queen, and you only. Yeah. I mean, yeah, only Tom. Just, I, yeah. I was, yeah, I was about to say there's a lot of games that you say like this is a very chess-like game. Yeah. Only mm -hmm. Tom, like you just said, um, uh, the Duke is another game yeah. that Norm owns. It's, it's very like that. Yeah, you mentioned Hive. Yeah, those very yeah, the, and those the uh, I call those the chess like because they're they they operate the same way that your pieces right. can only move a certain way and your goal is to you know, you know eliminate something or take over a piece of the board or right or capture yeah yeah and one that uh I we played a few years ago and I think you have this game Ryan that when I first started playing it, there were, there were aspects of the game I wasn't thrilled about, but I really liked the goal. And that was Santorini. Yeah. Mm, yes. Because in Santorini, you're, you're building up these little buildings and you're moving your guy around the board. And your goal is just to get to the top level of a building. Right? Yes. Am I correct? Yeah. Yes. Yep. It's yes, a, the one. To me, it's like a little race. Race to the yeah. top. Yeah. And I thought that was great because you're trying to manipulate the entire game to that goal, and it's not as easy as it seems to no. get to a top floor. No, it isn't. No, because both players have a god power that allows yeah. them to do things. At, right. that, Pull the tablecloth. Balance on that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a that's a that's a really good um and uh game win condition or victory condition. Yeah, yeah. I thought so. And it's obvious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know There's when no you subjectivity want it at all. Yeah, yeah. Now, could we put could we put into this category to um, um, cooperative games yes. like a, like yeah. say your pandemic system? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Your that's goal. Your goal of the game is to eliminate. In pandemic is, is to eliminate all the um, or the find a cure for yeah. all the diseases. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah co-ops are also really good for this. And co-ops have that extra added thing where you also have the losing conditions, oh, right? Several. And usually they're varied. Yeah. In yes. pandemic, there's a few ways to lose. And, and they come at you from, yeah, like you said, varied from all different directions. Cool. Right. And I think another good one for this are kind of those one versus many games. So I'm thinking Scotland Yard. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you catch them, that's it. Yeah. You win. Yeah. Or if you outlast for this many rounds, you win. Do you guys think of any other, like, specific goals that, that stand out to you? Specific goal, like, I think we've nailed the ones that I was really kind of thinking about. Because um, when, when Norm brought up the race games... Um, the ones that I were that I was considering that I want that I was thinking about the race ones were still um, still had points. Oh yeah, I do want to talk about those. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 we're going to get to those. So yeah. I couldn't think. Yeah. Of, I can't think of any. I'm glad like, you brought up like the one versus Rouge, many. That that one. That's that's a straight. Who crosses the finish line first? Right. right? Um, uh, I, I was going to say camel up, but then there's the then there's the the betting aspect that one's, too. So there's yeah, that, points. That one still there. has an abstracted point. That's not a true goal. To yeah, it. that's not a true goal. Uh, um, uh, oriented victory. And then there's also sort of the uh, the all or nothing type games, and so these will be ones that board gamers won't necessarily respect. So I'm talking about like Risk, where the goal is to take over the entire world. Or Monopoly, where you have to actually get everybody's money. Yeah, <laughs> right. The problem with this is, of course, when there's no there's no time set, right? That <laughs> that goal could take however long as it takes. Because yeah. and that's because diplomacy only lasts an hour. That's <laughs> <laughs> and even things like Battleship, or uh, <laughs> where you're trying to sink all the ships, or to make that a bit more modern, like the Star Wars X-Wing game, right? Where your mm -hmm. goal is to destroy everybody's ships. But who knows how long that's going to take, right? That's kind of a 
That's I think that's a downfall of the goal oriented. So if you've got a specific goal in mind, you go until that goal is met. Yeah. Cool. But at the same time, I think they're they can be a little bit more interesting. Um okay, so let's talk about the races a little bit. So I think there's kind of a difference between race games, like getting to a finish line. And I would and that could even include something like Quest for El Dorado. Right, where right. you're yeah. trying to get to like all you got to do is get there first yeah. if you do you win and the racing games that are actually based on racing games what was that one we played at your place ryan Ooh. the the car one downforce 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 yeah 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 yeah, yeah but that one that was not necessarily a re- like it, that's it's got a, the it's a simulation betting. of a race yeah. but you, yeah. that's right but you got like the Camelot. you got the betting of the money which yeah. is an abstract version of just gaining points because right? most of the times that i've Forgot won that. downforce i've lost as as a driver but i've i've won as a better <laughs> i have not won as either <laughs> <laughs> but then there's also kind of the points the point race right yeah and so if we start getting into victory points i think that there's a big difference between having a point cap right what's the mat you're trying to get a maximum number of points versus you know getting as many points as possible yeah right so what are some of your favorite games that have point caps that are a race to a specific number of points twilight imperium 4 yeah viticulture it's it's a race to 10 points oh viticulture is a good one too yeah and, and viticulture is a good one too because if once once somebody reaches the points um that 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 triggers the end of the game but you may have crossed yeah <laughs> you may have been the first one to meet it but you may not have necessarily won the game either that's a that's an yeah. interesting one to bring to, to bring up um uh hansa teutonic is another one where where you 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 get to a certain point threshold and that triggers the end of the game yeah um splendor does the same thing first person to get to um 15 points but you may not have been the you may have been the first one to get to 15 but the other player still has it one turn to react and get above 15 points that's another one istanbul is a race game where you're collecting gems and okay. the gem and and, and and the gems are your points essentially it's the first one to get to either five or six gems depending on the player count here's an interesting take on what we're talking about too um get to the certain point rajas of the ganges i loved how they did it where you're mm. you're moving your points like you have uh, like uh, like uh, um star wars uh, uh Rebe- i think it's rebellion where where you have two counters and you're trying to race to get those two counters on your point scoring track to to hit together at the same time which is which is unique i've never seen i haven't seen that done yeah so rajas the ganges is yeah you have one track is your money it's your income yeah and that's and that's the one that's going to go back and forth because you're going to be spending it and gaining yeah. it but then you also have like i call it they, they call it fame points but i call it the actual victory points like you do things and that's always just going to go up and right the game ends once somebody triggers um the, the crossing of those two of, of your two markers now you may not this is again this is a, i always think that this is a fantastic way of uh, these types of race games you may have been the first one to do it yeah. but other players still get to get the like say finish out the round and yeah. somebody might be able to do it like cross the streams better or something like that or score the, um, more points another game that uh, um i i sold because it just the group didn't uh, drive with it but the great zimbabwe um, where you have variable, each person has a variable end of game point uh, race depending on how 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 many like how many powers that they that they um, collect for their for their tableau. Um, you can go in without getting any god powers, and you have a very low um, point. Uh, race to get to but the moment that you keep adding these powers to your tableau that your point um uh, end goal keeps growing with the consideration of well you're more powerful now therefore your 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 goal threshold should be a little more distance because of the ability for you to make more points so i thought that one was very cool that that's very that's very sounds like very rise of queensdale ian doesn't it yeah yeah it does i've not yeah okay for the, the the further epochs that you um, have reached now your goal that in the next game you have a higher goal to reach but other people still have a lower goal and that 
they can trigger the end of the game if they've met their goal and you still haven't reached your higher goal yet. Threshold balancing. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that, that's an interesting one. Cool. I think uh, I think the again if I'm we're thinking of poster boy or poster ch- children for these kind of games. Uh, I think Settlers of Catan is probably the one that's yeah. most familiar, right? Yeah. Ten points. Yeah. First Basically person who gets ten. ten points, that's it. They win. No questions asked. And who and who's hiding the cards that have points on them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but there's also games like Kemet, where yeah, you're trying to get to a certain number of points, but then you also have to play out the rest of the round, and so you have to keep it for that round. And you could lose yes. those points, right? Yeah, hanging on to right. certain positions. Absolutely. Personally, I kind of like the once you get it, you win. Like, then, then that's it. Yeah. Game of, Game of Thrones is the same way. Once you get seven castles, you win. So if you get that, you can put everything you need into getting that seventh castle, and if you do it, you win. And I kind of like that, that dead stop. I don't yeah, know, you, what about you guys? It, it's interesting you mentioned, because I'm just bringing up, because I, I, po- I had posted this in our Discord chat um, on one of the topics as well. And um, I'm just going to bring it up here. It was Lord Pericles was the Discord namer. Hey, we're and name he brought, dropping awesome. More and, Discord activity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, he brought up the game Inish, yeah. which has one of those, it's a goal-oriented, I, 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 from, from what I'm gathering is a goal oriented yeah. once you've meet one of those goals but it's also got that chemist thing that you just mentioned that you have to hold on to it yeah mm-hmm. and so when when you bring into that you mentioned this earlier ian too you have no idea how long this game is going to take i've heard of games of inish <laughs> taking hours upon hours because it's kind Flip of like flops. the it's kind of like the group has met this has gotten to the stalemate yeah thing because Oh, it, it, it's, it's kind of like um, we when in, in poker, you just kind of watch the chips move around the table. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind yeah. of what happens. And the the third one in that trilogy, the first one, the one that came out, Cyclades, that one's kind of interesting because it's... Cyclades? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... It's kind of a point race, but it's only to two points, right? Because your goal is just to capture two cities. And so it, yeah. it kind of is just a goal oriented, right? If you capture the two cities, there you go. But it's kind of like a race to two points. But I guess it's too easy to get one city, so they had to make it two, yeah. right? Yeah, it's just too easy to get one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You made me start uh, thinking about uh, uh, a game like Dune, where the condition, if you're on your own, is uh, I think it's uh, three strongholds. And, three, yeah. But if you're an sure. alliance, it's five strongholds. So five or four. Yeah. yeah so that uh, j- just that right there tells me I need to play more Dune. Um, but that right there uh, presents another interesting thing uh, strategically. Like if you do your board assessment and be like, oh yeah, I, I can I can predict that I can do this on my own, or there's no way considering the state of the board, there's no way. So I have to change my victory condition. Yeah. Right. Cool. And, and Dune has another interesting aspect where, depending on who you play, oh, you might have completely different victory conditions. Yeah. Because if you're the Bene Gesserit, I was just thinking that. and you predict who's going to win in what round, yeah, yeah. and you get it right, yeah. you win instead. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so like, very good, Duke Atreides. Look at this. I win. Oh, come yeah. on. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's another, pretty cool, too. I think another cool game that could be brought up into this, too, um, I have not played it, but there, I heard a lot of people talk about Disney's Villainous. Mm. And this is a one where yeah. all of the um, characters that you play, um, they win the game in a completely different way. Um, I have I can't speak to the experience of this, but I knew that I heard that they say like the Cruella de Vil character yeah. in one of the expansions like her all her things are around like gaining dalmatians and once she yeah. gets to 101 dalmatians yeah. she wins the game yeah all the villains are so thematically connected to their uh, victory conditions yeah good pick good call cuz yeah, uh, uh, but i that and that's the game i have no experience yeah. with it but i've heard yeah i have i have the game in a couple of the expansions um uh, but have not had too much depth of play yet but uh that's what compelled me to go at this one with my with my daughter who loves her Disney was just that idea of of each character has a specific way and sometimes it works and sometimes it don't work at all. So 
Yeah, no. And how about the next one I'm going to mention before we move on? And you guys will make fun of me a little bit, but I actually really appreciate it as an interesting uh, way to end the game uh, in its Trivial Pursuit. So in Trivial Pursuit, it is kind of a point race. You got to get all six pieces of the pie, but then it's kind of that extra thing where you got to get to the middle and you can complain about the dice rolling to get to the middle all you want, but you got to win on answering a question correctly. And I, I like that. I like that you have to, that's how you got to win the game. Cut the red wire. Mm-hmm. Got to cut the red yeah. wire. <laughs> and I, I want to bring up, just as we're in this, because we're going to shift uh, shift gears here and everything. But there's an interesting hybrid of the two, which is the game Root, which yeah. is, it's yes. a race to 30 points. But also at some point in time, yeah, you yeah. could switch from going from points to dominance, which yeah. is, there's the dominance cards. And you say, hey, if I control these areas on the board, I win the game if it gets around to me which is kind of an interesting hybrid of the race mechanism up to the, to the point cap, or, hey, I know that I'm not going to get to 30 points, but I might have a chance at getting this other thing instead. What yeah, I, th- I really like that. The first time I ever played Root, I went for that. I tried that, and I realized how hard it is. Oh, gosh. Well, well I think what's... I it, almost did it. What I like, like about that, too, is that it changes the schema of the victory condition. Right. I mean, right. It's mm-hmm. like everybody else is playing within this this scheme of victory conditions, and then they forget about. I mean, that to me, that's what I've seen a lot of the of the limited plays I've had is that that everybody is so dialed into the same methodology and 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 mechanistic advancement that they forget about the one or two that have abandoned that schema to go and you know do some subversive <laughs> play. Right. But yeah. No. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's like a, you know, what's going on on the other side of this card kind of thing, as far as gameplay goes. Cool. If we start talking about like the open-ended victory points, which is a, what a lot of games do nowadays, I, I was kind of thinking of some dichotomies that go on in here. And so the first thing I want to talk about is high-scoring points games and low-scoring point games. Because if I'm thinking about a game like Archipelago, have you guys played Archipelago before? No, I have not. So Archipelago is an interesting one because the way you score points is hidden until the end of the game. You you don't know, you only know one way that is going to score the game. Everybody else knows the other ways and you, you reveal it at the end. And you don't score until the end, but the scoring is actually really low. Like it's only a few points. It's like you you get like a dozen points and that's it at the end of the game. Something like Viva Java is 20. I think Viticulture is what, 25? Something like that. Something like that. Eclipse is like a 30 point game. But then you've got games that are in the hundreds of points, right? (laughs) Ticket to Ride can be like 300, 400 points. Castles of Burgundy. Uh, 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 (laughs) And uh, one of my favorites, Russian Railroads, which is going to get, yeah, 400 points is like a typical winning score. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Remember my famous 600-point game there, right? Yeah, <laughs> you broke it. <laughs> and so what do you think determines that? When do you think it's a good idea for designers to, like, how do they come to the decision of whether to have a really high-scoring game or whether to have a low-scoring game? What do you guys think? I don't know what's going on inside of their minds because um, in a high-scoring game, I feel like that I've, I've done a lot of things. I've done a lot of little things that scored me a whole bunch of points. Um, we're talking about like the Stefan Feld point salad games, which are typically high scoring, sometimes are high scoring um, affairs. So maybe it's a correlation. Sometimes maybe it's a correlation of the things that you are doing, but then there's that, that, that flips on its head because then you can have a game like Merchants and Marauders, which is, it, it, that's right. another, I think, a race game. It's a, 10, 10 you're, points, you're, yeah. But you're doing a whole bunch of things, but not all yes. of those whole bunch of things are scoring you points. Mm-hmm. That's right. In, yeah. in, in that one. So I have no idea what's going on you know, in their brains. To me, that'd be like, do you like listening to speed metal or do you like listening to jazz? <laughs> right? I mean, to me, it'd be like... Neither. It, no, but you, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, like, it's like those, the comparison to those two are so, like, not even close to... To me, it's just like, it, it comes down to, um, as if it's a designer, 
I think organically, sometimes they'd be like, this is how my idea has panned out. And this is how the ending has to happen. Right. Um, but I mean, cause I've never designed games, but I have designed like uh, all three of us. I've had, I have designed course content material and it comes down to that idea of, am, am I designing towards an evaluation or is the evaluation going to be a process of our product of the process that I've created, right? I mean, it's that whole, do I, do I identify the goal of the game before I identify the process of the game or do I vice versa, right? So I don't know. That's an interesting thing because I enjoy okay, so both I'm, versions. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leap on this too because maybe it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fact of the – they had that design in mind. They have all their mechanisms. They yeah. have everything. They throw it all down. They had some idea of what things are worth. Like, what are these actions worth? Yeah, yeah and then exactly. It, then, then it comes out in the balancing yeah. process. That's what oh, I was going to say too, yeah. right? This, yeah. this, thing, this thing is, oh, this is a harder thing to do, and it's not worth very So that one has to have, to have to be worth more points now. It's harder to do, yeah. blah, blah, blah. It's going to be more rewarding. Oh, oh, but now, okay, now that makes this one undervalued. So now, okay, so now this one action now is worth 15 points. Yeah. And... Right. Maybe, maybe it comes yeah maybe that comes out in that balancing that that play testing and balancing part of the uh of the experience yeah you're trying to get the schema of all the different point ranges that can be made yeah. based on what's good what's not yeah and then what i've yeah. often heard from a lot of designers is the paring down process because it's a lot of the time it's like okay i have this game now i have to take stuff off until until mm. it's f- not functioning then i go okay now i'm close to where the game should be i mean uh, um i often refer to uh to with my students when we talk about content it'd be like we got to trim the fat right we can't we can, we have so much limited time now that we can't have extraneous information in any of our you know uh, delivery of our of our lessons now where it's okay extraneous stuff trim the fat we don't there's there's yeah. So it's probably mm-hmm. the same discussion as um, how does the designer determine how many rounds yeah. a game is going to go. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. They might have had an idea and then play test and went, this game's going to take days, right? <laughs> so I th- oh, that's just, I think, a function of the process, maybe. Who knows? We need to talk to more designers. <laughs> I, I, no, I, and I like some of these games um, where you're still scoring points, but it's um, it ends up being the least amount of points is the is the winner so like we're taking like the game of golf as the oh yeah, yeah. Front, front runner as in you're, you're trying to get your ball into the hole in the least amount of strokes possible yeah um but there's all but there are games out there that have been designed as like with that golf thing in mind that it, you're, you're trying to do something difficult and you're trying to do it better than other people so you score less points kind of like scoring only... high skying scoring high points is yeah. kind of bad like be blockus. more efficient. Blockus, blockus is, a, yeah. is, is, is a very good example of that. Because hmm. yeah, you're trying to get uh, <laughs> as many pieces on the board and you want the least amount of pieces left. Right? That's Blockus's I'd, goal. I'd say that's kind of a, a, a strategy for all Martin Wallace games, but that's more of how can I take the less loans than anybody? <laughs> the one who has yeah. the least amount of loans is usually the one who wins the game. This episode is proudly supported by the amazing team at Breakout Escape and Board Game Lounge right here in Saskatoon. Using industry-leading technology, Breakout Escape's escape rooms are all 100% uniquely designed by the team, ensuring their patrons have maximum fun while staying safe. As well, they are a fully licensed board game lounge with over 400 titles to select from to ensure fun for every gamer new and experienced. Be sure to check them out at BreakoutSask.com. At Breakout Escapes and, and Game Lounge, they believe that life is more fun when you play games. So, um, I'm just thinking yeah. about your, your, your example of golf. I can't think of many games that that no, is... I, I have... I have a small little card game called, uh, and I think you played it, Norm, called The Parade. Yeah. It's that Alice in Wonderland game. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah. yeah. You do not want to take cards because those cards are going to be worth points. And the goal of that one is that you want to um, I mean, take cards. You still want to take cards, yeah. but you also want to strategize that you score least 
I guess cockroach poker might come in is because it's it's well, a that's weird, an interesting game. It's a weird victory condition because there's no winner. It's basically there's an identified loser, loser, loser yeah. and everybody <laughs> else wins, right? So it's that high idea of I don't want that. That would be the golf thing. I don't. Want, I want a minimum score of zero. Whoever gets four of anything, that's the that's the loser. So I haven't seen that kind of that's a that's an anomaly that one that's an outlier cool the other thing with points that i think we need to talk about is when are they scored and uh, so yeah. <laughs> you're playing with me Cause never because <laughs> you, <laughs> you've got of course you got games where you're scoring constantly throughout right and so you can always see like who's ahead and who's not um and then you've got the games like <laughs> bring it back to golf again, right? Where you do the golf add up scores at the end, like seven wonders is the one that I would think of immediately or mm -hmm. Concordia yeah. and then um, you wait until the end and yeah. then you add everything up and you five, go, five tribes go. you add up at the end. Yeah. yeah. And I honestly, I think the best is a mixture of two because you want the suspense mm -hmm. of who's going to win at the end. Because if you're just, if you're everybody's scoring all their points all the time, yeah, you can see, oh, this guy's running away with it. I don't know how we're going to catch up. And that is like one of the problems that I have with Dinogenics. Because Dinogenics, you're constantly scoring the dinosaurs and it's really hard to catch up. Yeah. And it's really hard to, in the context of our conversation, to tell. You can tell that you're not going to catch yeah. up, right? And that can yeah. kind of take some steam out of the end of the game. I think. Uh what I love the most about this aspect are, and you might be, I might be jumping the gun here, but are the end of game bonus things that you can acquire. That's what, yeah, that's what the thing, yeah. so you, there's the games where you acquire yeah. the points throughout, but then you also gain something throughout the game, like an end of game scoring card that there's no that, one knows about. Right. Or, yeah. Like twa, the, the intrigue of like, we know there's end of game bonus, but what is out there now? Oh yeah. Cause I, I'm even, like you, I, I hate, I hate, it's anticlimactic to see, Oh yeah, so and so is going to win. But if people are hiding some of these end of game scoring, you know, modifiers, and that turns the that turns my intrigue yeah. around. And and it, it's bring the note too. Ian's favorite game of all time, Terra Mystica. You, that you always know how many points right. somebody has throughout the entire game. Yes, but you also have to. Well, I guess you can. With that one is interesting because you can calculate who's winning what, right? And so you can. If you yes. really want to sink into the math, you can figure it out. Um, Which usually but, happens with me with those hidden scoring guys, those yeah. hidden hidden scoring games, is that I'm sitting there on my later turns trying to f math out, okay, how many points does Ian have? He's got this, 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 and this, and he's done these things, and Norm's done those things and everything. So I'm like, my optimal thing should be to, and then do yeah. something. Yeah. Um, Hidden scoring games really cause a lot of a. Actually, both methods cause <laughs> lots of analysis paralysis. <laughs> well, I think one of the one of the great games at finding a balance between the two is Ticket to Ride, because oh, Ticket okay. to Ride you're yeah. scoring your routes as you go, and you all and then at the end you score your tickets, right? So whatever tickets you made, you score at the end, and you could gain or lose points based on yeah. whether you made those tickets or not. And I think those two halves are almost even. <laughs> like you can get almost the same amount of points in one as with the other. Oh, as far as the output goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah as far as the number of points that you actually get, yeah. Um, it drives me crazy when people play Ticket to Ride and don't score anything until the end, and then they start taking their root points at the end. I can already mm -hmm. tell Norm is one of these people. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay, good. What? Wait, wait. It's it's only Ticket to Ride New York that uh, that you do all the scoring at the end. I don't like that. On a score I, I like the fact that you're there's at least some sign of a progression. You got to be able to look at somebody in the face while you drop down like a six train and it'll go. Right. Oh, look at this. Look how far my little thing's going. It's way past yours, right? I mean, just in a little kind of. You know, sassy little head nod. Right? Yeah. There's, there's so, oh yeah, you have to have that. You gotta. Then what's the point, right? Yeah. But yeah, those end of game scoring are, are great ways that designers can get around that, right? They can add a little bit of suspense at the end. Yeah. yeah. But cool. what do you guys think about the scorecard at the end? What are your thoughts? The recipe like, card scorecard? Yeah. Love them. Yeah. Love it. 
<laughs> I, 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 I like the way because then I, I at least I can I can visually see <laughs> where did I get my points rather than me trying to sit there and possibly forgetting to add up these points and did I already add those things together I don't know I, I always end up having to write them down anyways if a game does not include a score pad is this, right. is this and the... especially if there's so many especially if there's so many different ways um, that you're scoring points for and you have not been adding them up along the way so like castles of burgundy is a game that where you're adding up all your points along the yeah. way and you're scoring points for completely a lot of different categories but it doesn't have a score pad because you're just going to take all of those mm-hmm. but if you're going to do majority of your scoring at the end of the game yeah you have to have a score pad. like uh great western trail i mean i yes. don't that yeah i think you would go bonkers trying to like track the scoring without a, without a score pad yeah, my recently reviewed um, Lost Runes of Arnak um, has a score pad. Yeah. Because there's lots of different things yeah. you're scoring your points for. Do you feel like it kills momentum at the end of the game? The game's done. To me, it's just like, like all right, okay, let's see. It, to me, it's 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 like uh, it's like watching uh, the results of a fishing derby. <laughs> it's like, okay, I know I did well. Come on, heavy fish. Let's go heavy fish, right? I mean, it's like, here's that end of game scoring bonus and... You pull what? out a fifteen-pound largemouth, or it's like I mean. Are you guys always the calculators? I'm the calculator. Yeah, I am too. No, I. And if we're playing, if we're playing together, it depends on whose game it is. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Even when we're playing at ToonCon, every time we play Seven Wonders at ToonCon, my our my friend Lloyd, he just grabs a scorecard and throws it to me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it'll be it'll be taking the score. Because then, because then the table etiquette is that everybody else is putting away the game. And you're adding it up. I suppose so. Oh, that's a completely different topic. Table etiquette. I love it. <laughs> Chicken or, wings for everybody. Or, or, or in my, or if with my games is I add up the game and I also pack away the game. <laughs> well, yeah. that's the wrong thing. So you got, can you guys think of any any interest games that do things interesting with with when they score or what's hidden and what's not? Can you guys think of any games? Well, you know what? I'm looking right at it. Churchill. Churchill is one of those GMT games where uh, it's 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 uh, the scoring conditions are so weird because it's if you score if it's a blowout then you lose right you have to keep your you have to keep your victory margin within reason of the so there's all this delicate okay. balance of all three and there could be a situation where where the the third player might win right? I mean there's all these different dynamic situations depending on the spread of points in between the players that mm. determines what of the three victory condition formulas you will follow that one i have i've yet to f- see another game that approaches um because because that condition dictates the way you play the game right so, so if you're starting to run away with points the other two might go go ahead man go ahead run away cuz you will not <laughs> win the game so you have to recognize you know when so, when people are letting you you know be dominant it's like whoa 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 i don't want to be i don't want to take that much of the pie right i mean so that one's interesting totally brian go ahead here's an here's an interesting thing i'm going to bring in a game like clank where depending on your position of the uh, at the end of the game if you did not get above the uh, above ground you don't get to score any of your points yeah. you can't win the game yeah. if you um if the game ends and you're below ground. So right. there's games like that where it's like, in order to have a chance at winning the game, you have to meet a certain condition. Um, one of my favorite games that I mentioned too is uh, Anachrony. And depending on your faction, every faction has um, a goal to meet by the end of the game. And you cannot win the game unless if your faction has completed its goal. If your faction did complete the goal and you were able to get off of the planet before the asteroid hits, you get to score your points. And you might be the only one that does that, so the, the points that you accumulated did not matter at, at the end. So I kind of like th- those are those are kind of interesting games where like you have to meet a condition in order to score. Yeah, yeah, and score score yeah. the game That's as well. A um, couple I had thought of uh, one that I had reviewed a while back was lowlands 
And yeah. that one's interesting because it's a point scoring game, but the value of what you have in your game and how many points they score <laughs> changes based on a final event, which is the flood, whether the flood yeah. happens or not. It can actually change the value of what you've done in the game. And so I think that's a cool way to end it. And the other one is survive. And so survive, you're trying to get your people off the island. But the problem is, is all your people have points underneath them that you don't see. And so not only do the other players not know how many there, what points there are, if you're not paying attention to your own pieces, neither do you. Yeah. And so you don't know until the end. You can get an idea because you can see how many people have gotten off the island. But mm -hmm. you don't know exactly how many points are going to score everybody. But I think is kind of cool. Um, one last one that I'm going to throw into, and really the only thing that I have left on my notes, is um, these point scoring games where it's like it's like an economic game or say something like Scythe, where the money of your game, it, how much money you have at the end of the game depends on determines who the winner. But you're also spending that money throughout the mm. game, so it's kind of like you're spending your points right. to take actions. Uh, Terra Mystica does this, the, you have those opportunities to spend points to gain yep. power. And so I like, I kind of like that interesting mechanism in a game where you are spending your points and also trying to have the most yeah. points at the end of How the game to win. How much are you gonna invest? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, like, right. and like it was mentioned on the Discord chat too, like a lot of economic games does this because most economic games is like the most money mm -hmm. wins, but you have to buy, you have to pay for your things. You have to pay for your workers. You have to pay for your factories. You have to pay you for your trains. Pays off. Yeah. 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 That's and a good so, point. So yeah, I like, I like those games paying you using uh, gaining actions by paying your points. That's a, that's always, it's always neat. So I thought we go, there's just a couple like sidebar ones I want to talk about. First, there's the games where nobody cares how points are scored, like Telestrations. <laughs> I don't think anybody <laughs> I know has ever played for points. Concept. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that we should we got to throw out a mention to the Kinesia scoring in games like Tigris and Euphrates oh. and Ingenious. Yeah. So in Beautiful. that, we have got, in this case, different color tracks or cubes that you're collecting, but you score based on the lowest that yeah. you have. Yeah. yeah. Sort of like what I was talking about with Vegas Showdown, right? You want you you got to keep things balanced, Respect so your lowest balance. is still pretty high. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, you, yeah. I don't like the sometimes that min maxing thing. To me, is like no, 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 no. You got it's it's a good player plays a balanced game. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. There's also some games that will have multiple win conditions, and the game I'm thinking of right now is Twilight Struggle. Yeah, Twilight Struggle's kind of got a neat. Uh, even the point system itself is neat because it's it's not just a track; it's like a tug of war. Yeah, right, where you've got the markers in the middle, and you've got the U.S. side of the score track, <sighs> and the and the Russian side of the score track, and you're moving the marker back and forth. It's tug of war, and if you get it to your end, you win. And if you don't, you could melt the globe into a glass sphere. <laughs> right, and so the other ones is if you cause a nuclear yeah if you cause the nuclear war yeah. you lose <laughs> you conquer i think it's conquer europe in a specific way you win like that's yeah. all you got to do when yeah. you win and, yeah. s and so there's different ways you can win that i think is kind of neat yeah seven wonders duel does this very well as in um there's three different ways that you could win the game um if you end up drafting all the cards you just add up the points and the most points wins but there's also the military track, which is if you draft military cards, you kind of push this tug of war thing like you were just mentioning back and forth. And if I manage to push the the military thing all the way to my opponent's side, I just automatically win the game. And then okay. there's a third one as well, which is the science track, which is there's a whole bunch of different science symbols. And as soon as you're able to draft um, six different science symbols, you win the game as well. So it's a Seven Wonders Duel. It's the two, the two player version of Seven Wonders. Three different um, victory conditions. Just either most points, uh, science victory, or military victory. And you have to pay, you have to be paying attention for all of them. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. I like I like that idea. That's it, it. Won't work for lots of games, but for some games like that, I think it's pretty yeah. neat. As long as you find the right theme, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention this one. 
which can anger a lot of people. Oh, I'm not winning condition already. <laughs> the win condition for Killer Bunnies. Have you guys oh. ever played Killer Bunnies? I've oh. heard. I've just only heard. Oh, no. Okay, so Killer I'm Bunnies. Face, I'm face did we just jump the shark? We just jumped the shark. No. You're, you got to listen to this one, Norm. So <laughs> throughout the game, you're collecting carrots. That's your goal. So you're, you're bunnies, and you're trying to get these carrots. And the carrots are all numbered or named or something. I think they're numbered. Okay. So they're numbered carrots. And then at the end of the game, there's a carrot deck, and you randomly draw a carrot number and whoever has that carrot wins the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm unplugging my headphones. I'm walking away. <laughs> so yeah. I think if we can all aspire to that, then game designers are doing great. So or basically, or, okay. How we'll about... sit at a table and spend an hour and then go, yeah. okay, whoever has a loony in their pocket wins. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much, that's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, or how about okay? Let let let's end off. If we're gonna start doing going down this rabbit hole, Ian, um, how about games like Munchkin, where I'm so close to winning, and then everybody just dog piles on me, I don't win, but then the next person says, "Oh well, no, everybody's all out of resources. I may as well just win the game right now." <laughs> <laughs> Munchkin is fine. I don't mind it. Ryan wants to turn this into a rant episode. <laughs> no, I'm done ranting. <laughs> so I, don't know, I think in conclusion, I, I personally would like to see games branch out a little bit more in how to win. Because I almost feel like we're using the point system a little too much. And I, I think that's a way in, in this, in this t- day and age where it's hard to stand out. Mm-hmm. Well, that just, might be a way to do that, right? I was just going to say innovation will will certainly look this way, you know. And when it does, it'll be rewarded because yeah. there'll be a popular title that comes out because someone innovated the uh, the condition to succeed. So cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think it's it's the it's the gaming mechanisms of the game that's going to also help define the game as well. Like we really, I was talking about Ruins of Arnak. Um, definitely not a groundbreaking game um, at all. But uh, as long as you can set, like you said, set yourself apart, it's not necessarily the win condition, but it's like, oh, how, how do you get to the win condition? Yeah, I think it's good. Also, it's going to set the game, set the game apart as well. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah, well, um, victory conditions. Victory conditions. I think. I think we. Everybody should this. take a victory lap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to make another pun. Is like we could chalk this episode up to a victory, um, depending on how you consider what the conditions of a victory. The fact that you're still listening. Yay, victory for us. Here we go. And uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, the uh, I had this was yeah. I, I'm starting to think about all my games now and reevaluating if. Uh, if it's the same or something's unique to it. But uh, yeah, a good one. Victory conditions. Uh, that being said, I'm your host, Norm. I'm the least victorious. <laughs> and I'm in. And we'll catch you later. <laughs>This has been an episode of Cardboard Conjecture, and we are Bridge City Board Gamers. And you can find us on Facebook at Bridge City Board Gamers Saskatoon. You can find us on YouTube, Bridge City Board Gamers. We are also on Twitter, at BC Board Gamers. And of course, Board Game Geek, Guild number 3039.